Hello, my name is Stephanie, and I'm here today with the Book Watchers at the Pickens County Library System. Um, and I'll just let you all introduce yourselves. <laughs> Let's go. My right. No. Okay. <laughs> That Thank doesn't you. make any sense. How about? <laughs> Hi, my name is Beth. I work at the Captain Kimberly Hampton Memorial Library. I run the House Calls program, and I'm going to talk about this book today. <laughs> okay, and Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm Jennifer Crenshaw. I'm the branch manager at the Central Clemson branch. And um, we've already done this book in our book club here at the branch, and we really all enjoyed it. So I hope we'll have a really great discussion today. Awesome. And I'm Margaret, branch manager at the Village Branch Library in Pickens. All right. Center Square. Um, to whom? I, I am Ethan. I, uh, <laughs> I'm the reference <laughs> assistant at the Liberty Branch. Hey, and I'm <laughs> Caroline, and I work at Circulation in Eastleigh. All right. And we are here today to talk about Fahrenheit 451. Um, for those who maybe haven't read it yet, um, just so you know, it's about Guy Montag. He's a fireman, but not, <laughs> not what we think of today as a fireman. Instead of putting out fires, his job is to destroy um, the illegal commodities, the printed book, along with houses in which they are hidden. Um, he never questions the destruction and ruin of his, and ruin of his actions produced. Uh, until one day he starts uh, after meeting Clarice. Who, uh, Hello, Clarice. That's all that's in my head every time I hear <laughs> Um <laughs> Clarice um, makes him think about why he's doing what he's doing. So let's just kind of get into it. Uh, in addition to the book, which was written in the 50s by Ray Bradbury, um, we actually have two movies. The, one, the first one was done in 66. And then the most recent one with Michael B. Jordan in 2018. Yes. <laughs> um, so how did y'all like the book? Uh, did it keep you engaged? Bueller. <laughs> More so Absolutely. than the movie. I think the most amazing thing yeah. for this book is how current it feels. I mean, it's amazing to me how Bradbury his visions are coming true in so many ways. There's so many places where this book is so relevant to every single thing happening it feels like in our lives every day. I totally agree. Which yeah. is scary, right? Because it's science fiction. Right. It's science fiction written in the 50s, but yet still. Um, and he does, he mentions all the wars in 2022. <laughs> like one little brief thing. <laughs> and the book is like, I was like, yikes. Um, like what do you, what do you call them? Atomic Wars? <laughs> this is the second time I've read this book and it did keep my attention the whole time, even though it was a reread, which I think is an accomplishment in and of itself. Um, one of the things, uh, why do you think in the very beginning, Clarice brings up a, um, a, uh, she says that her, somebody was, arrested for being a pedestrian why why would it be criminal to be a pedestrian at any point in time any thoughts don't jump in all at once <laughs> Okay, so nobody has any thoughts on, <laughs> on be, why? I'm All right, I'll I'll let, me do, let me jump in here. Talking. So, you, you know, if you're talking about why being a pedestrian, I think it just plays into the whole idea of why would you do something? The whole culture is saying, like, why would you do something in an old, outdated way when we have something better? And, you know, the whole book takes place in a, you know, in a world where it's not just obvious that you should do things the better way. It's now mandatory that you do things the better way. Uh, you watch your television for your information. You, you know, you don't, you don't read books. So why, why would you walk when you could take whatever transportation is in the world? Exactly. Um, and uh, Montag comes to learn that firemen are rarely necessary. 
um, that the public stopped reading of its own accord. Does, you know, we all work at a library. <laughs> Does it feel like that to you sometimes? Um, I mean, I know I personally have gotten people who are like, oh, what do y'all do? I mean, like, do people come into the library? <laughs> I mean, some people that really don't see the love of reading, which I know I do. It's like that part in Parks and Rec when she's like, oh, your job is, you know, the internet does your job. I've gotten that before, but I don't think people are not reading. Um, they're just reading specific niche genres that they like. They may not be reading widely. But the all of those niche genres would be outlawed in this world. Yeah, absolutely. But in this world, I think <laughs> people are just not reading as widely, but they are still reading. So that's something. But, you know, we in, in the uh, 2018 version um, of Fahrenheit, the screens are literally everywhere on the side of buildings. Can you see that as a possibility of what our future might would end up looking like? I mean, we're already glued. I, I mean, I know I wish I wasn't, but I know that I routinely have my phone in my hand, even if I'm not 100% paying attention to it. Yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> I mean, look at Times Square. It's already kind of like that, so that, but way more intense. And there are, I mean, there are people who advocate for this because there's like the post-human theory and the post-human movement and transhumanism, which is all about how we will move beyond our human bodies and become robots. So there are people who would live in this society, and those people are not me. <laughs> I don't want to be a robot. No, I don't want to be a robot either. Hot take. What we're saying, Jennifer? Getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was kind of telling. Um, I was just saying telling. that's where we are headed. I mean, are people that do see that as advanced? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm I, interested I, in hearing from anyone who wants that if they're in but, the comments. I kind of feel like in a weird way, COVID has kind of even moved that a little bit forward because everything is virtual now. Oh, yeah. So we're kind of virtually interacting. So we're we're not really with each other. So it's almost like when Mildred was watching, talking to her family and they were having those conversations on TV in which um, she thought she was a part of it, but she's very clearly not. It kind of feels like that's a little bit of what we're doing now to me, like with all the, you know, virtual aspect. Does it with anybody else? Yeah, it's begun. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do y'all really think was the main thing that caused Guy to start questioning his fireman um, job, his job, his life, his vocation. I mean, he had some pretty horrific experiences, like that lady lighting herself on fire. So I think That's like- But I'm like, there it is. Pretty much shock someone, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> I feel like the idea is, someone is willing to die for this, what's yeah. the point? And I feel like that's enough for someone to question their life goals. Well, but see, it, it, was, uh, it was alarming to me that it also, it had become so unfeeling. And it always took me back to my my nonfiction read for, for when you're try, trying to take the cult, where they're taking all of the emotion out of life because we're just happy. We're happy. Everything's perfect. So even when somebody dies, let's just move on, burn them down. Let's keep going, get married again. You know, it's, it's kind of the way that it was alarming and it, but I, I still feel like it kind of goes with that, you know, the removing books in which you think you, you 
you are escaping somewhere else, you're experiencing something else, um, you're also just not feeling anything else. I don't know. It sounds like what you're saying is that by removing- I think that's exactly it. We're numb. Yes, yeah. numb. When you remove fiction and you remove experiences outside of your own, you remove the ability to be empathetic to situations unlike your own. And so removing empathy from the human condition, what does it do? Yeah. The answer is not anything good. <laughs> <laughs> not anything good. <laughs> Nothing good at all. Um, Betty, BD was actually very well read. What did y'all think about that? I mean, like he was quoting um, various works of various works, <laughs> whether fiction, nonfiction, just mm -hmm. everything. And for to be able to quote this like that, that means you had to have spent time with it. Any, I mean, I know he made like a couple references to they let him read some so he knows what he's getting rid of, but what were y'all thinking about that? Did it seem like he might have more issue with what he does? So one of the things that <laughs> was I read some reviews of the movies after I watched them so I would know what the response was. And one of the responses about the 2018 version was that even though it was visually really stunning, it failed to capture the sort of power dynamics in the original book. And I think this is one of those where like, yeah, you're by not making him as well read, you're ignoring the fact that the power is top down. So he has that knowledge because he is in a position of power and that's what allows him to be well read. So again, even though um, we have a world full of people that are ignorantly fine with what they're being told they're fine with, um, the people in power still do read and know. So it kind of also seems like that means that these works do exist for them to have read and known them. Somebody like, like still exist. Maybe that's what I'm meaning. Still exist. Because in, in order for him and the other people at the top to know it, I mean, somebody's got it somewhere. Well, and that seems to make more sense in the newer version where the internet exists right. and so the internet is vast and things are in there that you wouldn't know are in there. Whereas that becomes more complicated when you've destroyed the physical copy and who does have it. But I think that is one of the things the newer movie does well is explain where could it be kept. I did kind of like the the visually seeing a blockbuster VHS tape. <laughs> I don't know why I was like, oh, blockbuster. I miss going to blockbuster and renting a movie, <laughs> walking around for an hour, picking out one movie because that's all you can afford. <laughs> and now it's like you watch fifteen in one night, but you know. <laughs> um, how uh, he. This, he says the destruction of books leads to a happier happiness and equality. Um, according to Betty Beatty, does he lecture? Um, does his lecture to Montag on the rights of man sound like any rhetoric still employed today? I mean, I, absolutely. And there is some validity to it. I mean, if people aren't arguing, they get busy and that's it. It keeps you distracted and busy with all these things. And you don't have time to question. That's one of the things that reading requires, or maybe not reading, but understanding. You have to have time to think about and process what you've read. It's not just you're taking in information. You have to be able to do something with it. There is a part in the book where it talked about the three things that were missing um in their information and their knowledge and that one of them was quality 
It wasn't fresh. It didn't have pores and texture and depth. It was, you know, Barbie doll versus a real face. Um, you know, it's had lipstick put on it and smacked over and, you know, dumbed down rather than being something you could chew on and ponder on and, you know, work with. Um, it was like a tree without roots is sort of the other thing they kind of compared it to. Oh, yeah. That it's, you know, either it rooted in something real and true, but that's more complicated than just something without roots and just floating there, you know, just to be picked. Um, but the three things he talked about being missing was quality, the leisure time. You know, you have to have time to really ponder it and think about it. And then um, being a, capable of doing something with it, make, putting it into action, using your knowledge. And I think that's where we're really running into a lot of trouble now. Everybody has opinions, but nobody's listening. There's a lot of talking, but there's not as much listening going on right now. Yeah, it's not a dialogue. It's not a, we're having a conversation to find out where the other is no. coming from. It's a, I'm gonna just yell at you my opinion and facts and you're wrong. <laughs> and all basically an all or nothing situation kind of like this. This is the rule and that's what it is. Um, how do we prevent that? <laughs> how, how do we as information professionals help restore that? Any I think um, thinking about it as like a, a big complaint of a guy in the 1950s, the book is just a big reaction to television coming up. And it's, you know, it's sort of his curmudgeonly angry letter to, you know, television. Um, and I think in the turn of the century, you know, people complained about people reading novels and newspapers too much. So I think whenever new medium, new media comes along, there's always this reaction to it that's like, oh, my gosh, we got to got to either stop this or rewind the clock or put the stuff back in Pandora's box. But, you know, like you can't, you just have to learn how to live with it appropriately. Um, like, like we learn to live with novels and like we semi learn to live with TV and now we're dealing with social media and the internet age. And we, we have to, as a people learn how to deal with it in ways that we get the benefits out of it but we also, you know, use it responsibly. All right. Um, yeah. Speechless. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All the <laughs> it feels like it. Um, if anybody's watching, if you have any questions this or thoughts, please feel free to chime in on, on, uh, in the comments section and we can, we can ask your question or uh, listen to your thoughts on something. Um, what do you, what were your thoughts on why the the movie it, the the book Clarice just dies fictionally off camera or you know out of book? <laughs> no, there's no camera in the book. <laughs> off, off page, the wife just says, "Oh, I think she died some day, some days ago." Whatever. Um, but in both the movies, Clarice does make a much larger. Um, it, you know, she's more involved in the whole story. Um, one as, uh, well, both of them kind of as a love interest. I mean, like basically <laughs> goes away with her at the end of the second of the of 66 and then he perishes <laughs> in 2018. <laughs> um, what what do y'all think why take the completely different endings to all of those there I mean I guess 66 is closer to the original but it's still not I mean like she died in the original she's happily ever after at the end with him um reciting their stories <laughs> thoughts on clarice i mean i 
I just kind of think that's probably just film trying to sell itself, honestly, because right. you have to sell a product and no one wants to see the lady die. And of course they want to make her the love interest because she's the only woman and, you know, well, except for Mildred, but you know, she's crazy. Also, I think that <laughs> it is for a woman to die in a book written in the 1950s. <laughs> So maybe a gender-specific decision. Yeah. <laughs> well, what about Mildred? Um, in the in the book, he's still contemplating his relationship with her at the end, and I don't know. I I, I don't. I mean, I can understand. I don't know. I, I was kind of torn with if I thought Mildred added or if she added anything to it, you know, in that she turned him in, but other people had turned him in too. And then she wasn't in the 2018 version. So I, I was going back and forth on Mildred's role. Um, and the fact that her, it was not really quantified as a suicide attempt necessarily in the movie as it felt in the book i kind of thought that was the point of mildred which is problematic in and of itself that her character is a suicide attempt but you know <laughs> but but see i also wasn't sure if she was always if maybe the not really being happy not really feeling like she had a part in society is what made her feel bleak and made her do that attempt. And it was after the blood flushing and <laughs> all of that stuff that, that kind of made her turn into the more even robotic version of herself. I don't know. But I think in the book, they were making a point that everybody seemed to be on some type of pill. You know, yeah. that wasn't addressed. Um, so that was a an everyday, you know, nonchalant yeah. thing. Don't be surprised if someone's taking some type of pill to make them feel okay. Right, to kind of keep up the happy charade. Right. right. Um, what were some of the great questions in your book club that y'all talked about, Jennifer? Mine seemed to be falling flat among this group. <laughs> Um, I was supposed to say, no, just a lot of about um, the numbness and where all of our lack of attention comes from, how busy our lives are, how easy it is to be numb, how easy it can be to not put down roots and have roots. You talk about um, Millie. I was to say, she didn't have any roots. She didn't have, she didn't have any way to withstand the storm around her. She just let go. <laughs> Um, and kind of blew away. Um, several of the things I had looked at in the book too. Let's see. Da, 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 da. One of the quotes and passages I really liked from the book in my version, this version, was on page 115 where it talks about what is there about fire that is so lovely? Because no matter what age we are, what draws us to it? Um, and it's perpetual motion, the thing man wanted to invent but never did, or almost perpetual motion. If you let it go on, it burns our lifetimes out. Um, you know, it's just sort of that ethereal reaching for it. It's always that metaphor for the grasping, you know, what's out there beyond us that we're always looking for too. Um, I thought the book never, you know, really went into sort of who was puppet master at the top. You know, we talked about it. Yeah. Just, we alluded to it, but there's never any real definition of who Big Brother in this case is. Um, and I wonder at some point if it doesn't sort of mean that, that it's just gotten beyond and it's sort of now its own monster. Um, you think about AI and things like that, you know, at some point we kind of run ourselves into the ground and, you know, we was relevant um, to the point where we may not need ourselves <laughs> at some point. We were talking about, what was it, Beth, you said the um, 
the transhuman. Yeah, and there's the, this thing called the, sing kind of the singularity. Have you guys heard anything about that? It reminds me of this, where it's like the singularity is coming, and that's basically like when we'll create robots that will destroy the human race. But I mean, we currently have social media platforms that are listening and <laughs> and alerting us to things we did and did not want to know, buy, or <laughs> think. Um, you know, uh, my sister mentioned a hotel the other day, and all of a sudden she started getting some ads for that hotel popping up. She didn't search it anywhere. She really only talked about it in person and within moments. So, you know, um, have y'all... I haven't watched it. Elizabeth had watched the uh, social media thing on Netflix. And just oh, how social those, dilemma? Yes, that. Yeah. that. <laughs> um, just how, it, it, you know, that is already thinking for us kind of like what you were saying, Jennifer, where it's kind of beyond just somebody who's coming up with this. <laughs> the computers and the algorithms yes somebody did come up with those but it's kind of taken a life on its own it feels like anybody all right well, the other thing i think about with the book a lot too i say it's the roots you know, that reading gives you roots, it gives you foundation, it gives you some base to argue for rather than just yell. That's what I say. Anybody can have an opinion, you can have a voice, but how well researched, how well defined, how rooted is your philosophy, your thought. And um, I think that's just the biggest thing I keep taking from this book every time is it, you know, have an opinion, but research it, know what it is be able to kind of stand your ground and be able to not only stand your ground, but be able to hear somebody else's ground too, you know, and really I worry about our level of tolerance these days. That's a value that I think is rapidly diminishing. Um, I think social media has made it very easy for people to go. I don't agree with you. Therefore you don't exist. I'm unfriending you. Bam, you're gone. And we don't challenge our own views enough. We don't take time to think about our own views up. It's so easy to get so busy with just all the busyness and, you know, I'm going to go watch Danton with the Stars instead of, you know, whatever. Um, but I even see that just with our books going from print to digital format. Ethan mentioned that, you know, a new format comes out, it changes things. Um, and going from a print book to an audio book, I mean, you're already mm -hmm. inserting another person's view and layer on top of the original text. You have somebody reading it or interpreting it for you. And right. it is a different experience and it changes how you understand it. Maybe sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Don't know. Um, That's true. But there was a section there where also in this version, I don't know, there was an afterword. I'm not sure which books had the afterword, but he talks about how different people wanted to shorten his books or um, take parts of it out. There was a, you know, a high school that had taken out all the hells and dams and um, they wanted to, um, consolidate, you know, and make it shorter, make it quicker, take it down to just one or two pages worth. And so instead of reading Hamlet, you're reading a one page summary of Hamlet. And now you know what you need to do about Hamlet and you just go on. I mean, that's kind of the difference that makes, you know, you need the original text. Again, too, going to a digital format, we stop owning it and start accessing it. And that's a really huge difference too. I was reading an article about that the other day. You know, if it's digital and Netflix owns it, or if it's on overdrive, if we lose access to it, you don't have it anymore. You know, now our, our society is moving much more toward an access model than an ownership model. I sort of own this book, it is in my hand. Right. You know, and if I want to lend it to somebody, I can. Um, but you can't do that with a digital book. That's true. Um, and that's much harder to do. You know, they talk about things disappearing off the Internet all the time. Internet Archive exists for that reason. And yet things disappear on a regular basis and we don't even know it. Yeah. 
two Those things. Some of the other issues we talked about before. I think it's really interesting this book that you have repeatedly mentioned the reference to roots and root systems, and it sounds like we took two very different things from this book. Um, you were talking about like millions of put down roots and unable to establish herself. But when I think of roots, I think of plants because that me and plants have elaborate root systems. And so when you're thinking about what a root system means, roots become entangled and they're large. And so it's not just about the roots that individual characters put down, but about the roots that these systems put down because this is a book about censorship and how those things become entangled. And so even you as an individual are tangled up in a system. And for me, this is very much a book about systemic problems because people aren't just censoring themselves, they are being yeah. censored. Also, you mentioned electronic reading. And I just wanted to say that I once read a study that talked about when you read online versus when you read in print, you read differently. And when you read online, you're more prone to what's called F-shaped reading, which is where you just read like the top two lines of text and then skim the rest. So as we're transitioning to digital reading, we are transitioning to a format that makes it easier for us to engage lists, which is, I think, a large part of this narrative also. Wow. Well, I will say I'm a, I definitely do digital reading, <laughs> but so do I might need to pay attention to how I'm reading. <laughs> I haven't, oh, I, did. I, I haven't really thought much about it, but um, of whether or not it stays with me the same as those books in my past. But then again, but at the same time, like as a librarian, I'm a huge advocate for like audiobooks aren't cheating and like listening to a book is the same as reading it. But when processing, is it the same? A lot of people say that it's not. Yeah. I mean, because you're you're totally right when it comes yeah, to audiobooks. It's audio hard to find a balance. I know yeah. not with the book. Of, no. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, I completely agree. I am a huge audiobook listener. And that's one of the reasons I sort of feel like I can tell a difference between the two. Occasionally, there are some that I just can't listen to. I just have to, some you have to read. It just depends on the kind of book it is. Did everyone I mean, read this? Or did anyone listen to it at all? I listened to it. Okay, Margaret, um, tell me about that. Well, like um, Jennifer, I am a huge audio person and um and just for time wise it was just more convenient for me to listen to it and and it, the narrator was great so the I know it makes it did you yeah. do the, the tim robbins i did it through audio um yeah i'm not sure yeah. who was i think narrator. it was tim because i basically um i did half and half because I, I ended up needing to do something with my hands. So, so that's the reason why. And it's it like, I would look, I was looking down at my hands. So I was like, I've got to listen to it because otherwise, um, but, but I, I liked him, but you're, you're right. You also, you know, he made voices when he talked to certain people mm -hmm. as, as Mildred's friends, he was like, you're awful and I hate you and I won't ever come in your house again. <laughs> you know, I mean, like he did the voices. So even if you weren't going to read it that way, that's, you know, how you read it. Um, uh, here we have uh, Stephanie says, uh, I tend to retain more of a book's information and remember more when I listen to audiobooks. Um, but yes, the reader makes a huge difference. Yes. Um, Jennifer uh, alerted us to the fact that uh, Fahrenheit 451, since it was the anniversary, there was the the multi-readers, Neil Gaiman, um, my mind completely blanked on everybody else. Did anybody listen to that, that, that version that came, that was in, that was in August? I did not. 
I should have regrets. <laughs> I, didn't I know I was like, I, I wanted to, but it was like, I just, I, I had to read my other ones first. And so I didn't get a chance to, but I was like, I was wishing that I could have access to that one after the time period. Did everybody watch, did anybody watch either of the movies? Yes. I watched both. Caroline, yeah, Michael Jordan, but not the first one. But not the first one. Okay. Stephanie, which one did you like more? Well, you know, I like the 66. I don't know. It must have been that big red building that was the firehouse. <laughs> it, almost, it almost looked like a drawing of a building that they were driving out of. Um, but, and, and I mean, that fire truck killed me. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I wish I had a picture to put up of that fire truck. I do think the first one was more true to the text than yeah. the yeah. remix. Um, I had a lot of questions about the remake. So Caroline, what did you think of it? <laughs> Tell me. So, it was like super boring. And oh, you really didn't like, like it. Why? God, I just lost interest. I thought surely I could look at Michael B. Jordan for two hours, but I did not. <laughs> <laughs> he did not save it. <laughs> oh, it was boring, but did you notice there's a, like the fireman, I know, firemen but like i thought maybe there would be fire women in the new version and it, it was like a very hyper masculine fireman fight club sort of thing. Uh, yeah. yeah and i was like this is wild and, and that was the opening scene like yes. <laughs> it felt weird that that was the opening scene is the and, and i noticed that they did this thing and guys it's wild. They're the firemen are like celebrities. Yeah. So it's yeah, like, like Instagram stars. Yeah, like it capitalizes Influencers. on YouTube star and like the Instagram influencer. But and it like, kind of follows. I mean, like yeah. if, if you know, if Mildred was loving her family, it makes sense that people would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but I, thought, I just thought like bringing celebrity culture into a narrative like this is so interesting, especially because that's not in the original version at all. That's entirely new. Yeah. And I like mean, they were trying to make it more modern, honestly, yeah. to appeal to a more modern audience. And because, I, yeah. I think if you're going to bring in like a social media aspect, which they did, you sort of have to bring in the celebrity culture because that's one of the things about social media is that like it makes celebrity culture more accessible. And so like when we make these beacons of censorship more accessible and they become famous, what does that mean for the works they are destroying? which should be famous. It was very interesting to me, but overall I thought that the newer movie was disconnected from the original text in a way that I was like, all right. Yeah, and um, for those of you that didn't, it, instead of just the people memorizing all the text, apparently birds yeah. were. Yeah. <laughs> what happened at the end with the birds? The I don't birds. know. The birds had, were implanted with. The birds head. aren't real. <laughs> well, there were like some books. There was like, they have a Moby Dick and Virginia Wolves to the Lighthouse and the Bible. And that was it. Those three. Oh, there was Harry Potter too. Yes. Did you see that? And, yeah. and I kind of want to be like, why those though? Why those books of all the books, specifically Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse? It's a stream of consciousness novel and it doesn't make any sense and nobody wants to read it, or at least I didn't in college. <laughs> so, I mean, all the bad books. <laughs> that's an interesting choice. All right. It's not the but, best one. But yeah, I, mean, I didn't Virginia understand the words at the end. That is a me opinion, not like a. <laughs> Everyone opinion there are probably people in here. Oh wait, also you love Virginia Woolf. He died at the end of the movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I just remember that. Well, I blocked and, it out. It was traumatic. And <laughs> she had a lawyer. She was like, oh excuse me. Stephanie was like, oh he died. You just like didn't even <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it was okay. So, yes, he murdered somebody and all of them, set them up, somebody on fire and all of them. But they also took a different approach to who he murdered and all of them and why. <laughs> like, all of them were, you know, yeah. a, a, it's very much that meme where it's like, cool motive, still murder. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like they tried to lessen it by he murdered the guy who told on him instead. Yeah, which was super rude, I guess. I don't know. His boss, okay, his boss looks like Quentin Tarantino. So the whole movie, Woo! I'm like, please set him on fire. But <laughs> he never did. I was really upset. <laughs> he does look like Quentin Tarantino. I didn't even think about that until you said it. That's wild. Celebrity lookalike. Celebrities have celebrity lookalikes? That's a question in and of itself. <laughs> That's too For deep. another day. <laughs> um, okay. If you were to have to keep a book alive by memorizing it, what would your book be? Green Eggs and Ham. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only one my brain could remember. So hard. See, I'd still go childhood, but Shel Silverstein, um, Where the Sidewalk Ends, is like that whole book of poetry. I got at least four of those poems down already. I think I could do it. Probably not in the right order, though. I don't know if I can do this. I feel like if you gave me like a genre, I could tell you like <laughs> this is a genre that I would memorize. But like I can't just pick one, and it wouldn't make sense to pick something within a series because I'd be like, "Who's Harry Potter? And what happened to the rest of the story?" <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I would pick like. Natasha Trethewey's Native Guard, which is a book of poetry, so it doesn't need any other framing. Ethan, Margaret, Jennifer? Just the Probably Lord of the Rings. You only get one, though. Only one Lord of the Rings book. Yeah, book which one? I have it in one big book, so. <laughs> the loophole. Good luck. <laughs> May the odds be ever in your favor. <laughs> We didn't say how long we had to memorize it. It did seem like a weird world in the 66 movie when everybody's just walking around reciting their books to themselves. <coughs> I think that that's a weird, that's a weird way to live as well. <laughs> like it'd be one thing if you were sitting around listening to the other people recite, but instead they're all just reciting to themselves. And I mean, I understand it so that they can remember it, but it still seems weird. In the new movie, I noticed, so when they're burning stuff, like the opening titles or like all the things right. being burnt, one of the things being burnt is sheet music. Oh. I guess so I there was like some sheet music of Mozart, and I was like, does that mean that nobody gets to listen to it? Or do you get to listen to it, but like nobody can ever play it again? I don't know what that means. So ponder on that. I don't know the answer to that. Because if I can't listen to music, I'm going to dedicate all my brain space to remembering what music sounds like. Oh, that's true. Yep. I got a lot of songs now. Yes. Well, I guess it goes back to the pe pedestrianism versus driving thing. You know, why would you, you know, outlaw the hard way to do something? So why would you learn, why would you learn to play the music when you could just listen to it? Exactly. Yeah. That's fair. I mean, I can't it's, play it's, music. it's all old music. You don't want anything new? I just can't imagine that. I guess that does beg the question, are they making new music? I don't want to live in that world, y'all. No. I can't. It's a no. <laughs> it's a no from me. I don't want to live in a world without new creative stories being told. I love finding a good series that has like, I don't know. I love a series because I love to really get invested with people, and characters, and places. I love that's, it. I mean, that's a big mood. Absolutely. What about you, Jennifer? What book would you uh, memorize? I don't know. We were talking. You're talking about discovering new things. Sometimes I feel like it gets harder and harder for me to get surprised. So anything that surprises me, 
sticks a little harder. Um, and I do do a lot of listening. We talked some of this it's about Harry Potter. I can't imagine Harry Potter without Jim Dale. I mean, that's just, there's no way. And yeah. I, actually, I was absolutely terrified he was going to get hit by a bus or something before we got to 2020. Um, so very he made it <laughs> a lot of the things I do now here because I do hear them. And so it would be easier for me to memorize Harry Potter because I can hear Jim doing it in my head. I can hear the Hunger Games in my head. Um, and what's really awful is when they switch narrators on you in the middle of a series. That absolutely tears my nerves out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that is start hearing that one voice and then it changes. Um, I don't know. I have no idea what book I would choose. There are lots I can give you the first lines from, but beyond that, I don't know. <laughs> what about you, um, Margaret? I don't know. Um, Beth and I were quoting Jane Eyre the other week. I was literally about to be like, I know what you're thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> Me, I think the Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens, because there's so many different versions of that. So that's a good one. That's it. I love it. Speaking of the Christmas Carol. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's coming. <laughs> well, I was for for Book Watchers December, I was thinking holiday favorites of um Oh, I'm not gonna one <laughs> <rise off>. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna listen as Margaret recite. <laughs> Margaret is going to recite a Christmas carol all the way through. <laughs> Ethan is going to act it out while she's I think that sounds like a good option. Yes. I, that's I, it. That's I, the point. Tune in, everyone. Surprise. <laughs> um, um, oh, let's see. Um, okay. Um, do you think? There is any reason to um, allow censorship? No. Good. <laughs> right answer. Um, I mean, you know, because yes, things can be, you can be offended by something, but. So what? <laughs> Sometimes a fine line of like, so what? censorship. What'd you say? What'd you say, Jennifer? I said sometimes in the library world, it is a fine line between censorship and selection. In some ways, we censor our collections all the time because we're selecting and choosing what to put in there and what not to. I mean, we make those decisions every day as buyers. I'm going to buy this one and not that one. We've already got four of these. I don't need this one, you know, and yeah. nobody is reading this, so I'm not going to put it out there. But um, there is a difference in saying we already yeah. have four of these and like, just, I don't agree with it. Yeah, sure. But I mean, it it does come into play that there are certain times that I'm like, eh, I really hate this book. <laughs> I don't want to buy it. I'm only buying it. <laughs> or I don't like that author. <laughs> but I know everybody else likes it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to do it anyway. So it's uh, my opinion of it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, I just have to. Um, Suck it up. Yeah. Well, I don't know for y'all out there who are in the library world, we don't just get to buy the things we like. I have to buy things that I'm like, I don't know anything about that. And I have to read it on the internet to figure out what's popular because I've never read a Western, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my best, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't have to have Check either. out an audio book. It'll be good. <laughs> yes. I'll give it a shot. If somebody has a Western suggestion, I'm open. Walt Longmire. <laughs> Unforgiven Clint Eastwood. Longmire. Go Longmire. 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 Okay. I'm ready, y'all. I will listen to one. 
<laughs> one western. Mind you, I didn't actually read any of Longmire <laughs> the show, so I'm really lying. What's that one movie that everybody loves? It's a western. Is it? Okay. Then I'm gonna have to check that out. What, um, was it, what did he what? say? What did he say? It was a really popular movie. It's a western and everybody it. it's tombstone. That's it. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I feel like I'm <laughs> we just got a four disc collection for that or whatever in today. So there you go. Y'all come get Tombstone. Yeah. <laughs> um okay. Well, um, in wrapping up, uh, I did want to mention that our um Halloween scary read for October. Is going to be the Shirley Jackson, the house, the haunting on, of Hill House. Um, it's going to be good. Show up, y'all. I'm excited. Um, and with this one, you have three options. <laughs> yes, we have uh, this one is looks super scary. Um, the haunting. I mean, the lady looks just petrified. Um, that movie and is. That's, <laughs> I believe that that's in the they're from the '60s, mm -hmm. was the, um, and then the '90s version of the haunting, mm -hmm. and the current. Um, this one is on Netflix, and we just got this into the system. Um, and this one is series, so I don't know how. You know, they, they are not doing a second season of the haunting of Hill House. The second season is haunting going to be. It's going to be a version of Henry James' Turn of the Screw. So they're not doing... Oh, uh, so it's kind of like a different... Um, so y'all don't get to kind of... Kind of <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you all for the, joining us uh, for Book Watchers. Um, and... Stephanie, I have suggestions to you. Oh, that's right. That's right. In the comments. Best bookshelf. Do you want me to do them here? Yep, or you want you to do them? Or both? Uh, I'll do both. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you liked this book because it is a classic, I would recommend you read Brave New World by Alice Huxley. It's very much the same, and it has the same sort of thing that Jennifer was talking about with things coming to fruition. Um, if you liked it because it's science fiction, I would recommend a graphic novel series that we just got in here at the library. It's called Saga and it's by Brian K. Vaughn. It's very it's popular. Good. It's good. The art is beautiful. It is a more adult series. So maybe not for your kids, but perfect for adults who love science fiction. And if you love this book because it's about censorship and you want to read more in that neighborhood, I would recommend The Book Thief by Marcus Suzak, which a lot of people really love, or uh, reading Lolita in Tehran, which is a memoir in books. So all of those are wonderful, and I hope that you enjoy them. And if you do, please let me know. Um, and again, we picked this book because it is banned books month. Week. month week. Um, <laughs> well, it's, I think banned books week is actually next week, so that's why I'm just calling it the month. We're just early. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, celebrate your right to read choose one of the banned books um, and I do thank you for joining us and I thank you all for agreeing to do this lovely program with me and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.